I tell you what, um, no, no pressure, but you are the first person to be on the show in almost three years that's going to talk about the Philippines in any particular detail. You better amazing. Ace, you, you've got to ace it, lady. The bosses are going to be watching this. <laughs> <laughs> How exciting! How exciting! Yeah. How exciting. I'm super happy to be here and, and to chat to everybody about the Philippines, diving in the Philippines and um, anything else. Yeah, happy days. Hey, now let's um, let's start where we usually start with all the guests that come on the show. And why don't you give us a rundown on where you got uh, involved in diving to start with? What's your background? Uh, so I got certified in 96 um, in high school. This is just as fun diver. I'm originally from Israel, which is uh, still where diving is considered cool activity for young people. Um, <laughs> it doesn't happen everywhere around the world, uh, but it still is uh, in Israel. Uh, people do get certified. People do consider it cool. So I got certified in high school um, and was a recreational diver for about 13 years, you know, kind of like diving once or twice a year on a dive trip somewhere. Uh, went to the States, uh, did my bachelor and my master, worked in corporate America, um, and did my my stints in the Caribbean for diving, you know, Dove San Martin, Dove Mexico, um, Playa del Carmen, Belize, you know, the once a year kind of trips. Um, and then I had a very early midlife crisis at 30, where I realized <laughs> I'm stuck in a place where... <laughs> I don't want to be yeah. um, and kind of left all of it, all of it, um, the corporate life, definitely the business that I've uh, started, uh, the U.S., everything all together. And uh, I don't quite remember how it happened, but I do remember that I was at the time looking at things that make me happy. And that was obviously white sand and sunny weather mm -hmm. after living in the East Coast for nine years um, that that would do that to you. Yeah. So uh, when I did my dive master in Honduras, um, and I remember, <laughs> I remember when I quit, everybody thought I was going to be a freelance consultant in the field of healthcare IT, which is what I was doing before, yeah. um, working in hospital, implementing clinical software for physicians and pharmacists. And um, then uh, everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, you'll, you know, you'll be back. Your job will wait for you after this um, short stint. <laughs> Uh, obviously, went to Roatan, Honduras, never turned back. That was 13, 14 years ago. So is that where you did your training? Um, that's where I did my dive master. So I have a CMAS two stars. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, that's my initial certification in Israel as a recreational diver. And then I did my dive master um, in Roatan. Nice. I'm actually going to Roatan yeah. in August for the first time. <laughs> Yay! I love it. I spent almost a year there. It's an awesome, I wouldn't say a rock because it's kind of a big island, but yeah. Um, yeah, great diving, excellent people, just, yeah, yeah, just exactly the life I thought I would want. So oh. yeah, did that and then guided around the world for about two and a half years. Um, Roatan, Mexico, Dominican Republic, back to Roatan, Philippines, Palau. Mm-hmm. Um, and at some point in Palau is where things kind of came together where, ooh, there's a business background there. And that's when I stopped guiding and kind of went into this mixing the love and passion for diving with a business background. Yeah. So like sales um, management. I've been doing uh, that ever since. Yeah. <laughs> You've had, um, a, what kind of span of a career was that then from, from actually going into, you know, I'm going to chuck some fins on and start guiding to actually doing what you're doing now what kind of time period are we looking at um so two and a half years where i was guiding mm. or well, and um and after that um i landed um in palau and then i did um kind of a consulting project for a while about processes around reservations I okay. think one of the one of the issues in the dive industry is, is there's a lot of people who grew in this industry and were instructors and then said, hey, I'm going to start my center um, and start working. And when you're on small scale, that can be very manageable, especially with high involvement and knowledge of the industry. But when you start looking at larger operations, I think processes are often being missed. Yeah. So we kind of mapped out uh, a process uh, of 
where a guest or an agent goes through from the initial inquiry through the reservation process and how do we make that process better, also including automation. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, this industry, you would go into a dive center almost anywhere and you'd find people still working either on paper or on Excel. Yep. And if they're super sophisticated <laughs> on Google Sheets, you know, so yeah, there's that. Um, and of course, there are some certain companies right now that are coming in and, and fixing that. But I think we're a bit of late bloomers here in this industry um, yeah. when it comes to technology. So, um, yeah, that's kind of when it started. Um, and then there was a bit of a pause there. I uh, work for an NGO that was doing projects in Africa mm -hmm. around community centers and technology education. I did that for about a year, spent some time in Africa. Um, and then uh, went back to the dive industry to do exactly what I do today. Mm. Did that for three years, two years, and then uh, went to run a resort and a restaurant in Costa Rica in a place with no diving. That was kind of more of the hospitality background of it. Mm. And then seven years ago, almost seven years ago, six and a half, joined um, Atlantis Dive Resorts and Level Boards in the Philippines. Which First is where as a reservations at. manager. This is where we're at now, eh? Yep, exactly. So yeah. first as a reservations manager for the, the two resorts in the Level Board and uh, full-time sales and marketing since 2019. Nice, nice. And congratulations. I mean, it's a, it's a nice um, run of... Um, or turn of events going through that that career process that you've got there because so many people like you say they get stuck at the guiding bit or the instructing bit and, and get stuck in one location and I think being able to show that you, you can move on and you can progress to where a lot of professionals would say oh well that location's better than this one and how do you get to work in this location and you know just by getting on the uh, getting on the boat and, 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 and getting your fins wet and and cracking on and, and striving forward, I suppose. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, well, when I was guiding, everything that led my decision was, at least back then, eh, uh, was not about uh, money or which island is better. It was well, where the diving was better. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I got a great job offer in Vietnam. And then I went and looked at diving in Vietnam. And I said, crap, I don't want to dive there. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to dive there. I definitely wouldn't want to guide there. So that's kind of where I think I made my decisions yeah. um, and ended up, for example, Dominican Republic, I was working in, Sama, in Samana Bay, which was, I didn't, fa I didn't fancy very well, very yeah. much. So, yeah. What, was it, what was it like in Costa Rica? Uh, Costa Rica was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, definitely one of the countries that I that I love. I didn't do anything related to diving at the time. We were mm. running a resort and a restaurant uh, in a place called Santa Teresa on the uh, Pacific uh, coast. Mm -hmm. So surfing, yoga, very virgin beaches, and and you did you didn't do any diving at all. No, so I came there pregnant. So I've got two little ah. ones, two future divers. And uh, when we moved there, I was uh, three months pregnant. So went through the pregnancy there, gave birth there. Um, and then we left to go to the Philippines when our oldest was one. That's a damn fine excuse. I was going to give you so much abuse for going to Costa Rica and not diving, <laughs> but I'll let you off with that one. <laughs> I was going to dive, but obviously, you know, as my partner said, there's half of me in that too, so I do get a say. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Oh, dear. Um, okay. Hey, I've just realized as well, actually, you're talking to me from home in Israel, aren't you? Yeah. I'm going to be almost on your doorstep next month. Oh, superb. Um, Egypt? Uh, Jordan. Hi, yeah. come over. We're, We're go so close. We're going to um, Aqaba. They got the, nice. Yeah, they've got the first underwater international photography competition going on. Um, so I'm there for yeah. a couple of weeks. Mm. Cool. Um, it's, a, it's a joint venture, actually, with the Israeli government. There was the first underwater um underwater photography exhibition mm. which actually happened underwater in a lot which is right where that tip is so Aqaba is here and a lot's here on the tip of the red sea uh -huh. um very very interesting efforts there uh the king is a diver yeah um, so, so I that's hear. a really huge uh 
Yeah, yeah. He's a diver and his wife's a diver. So he's the one who created also the amazing underwater uh, scenery that they have there now because they drowned a Royal Jordanian 747 you can dive in and mm -hmm. some um, tanks and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah, great, great, great diving. Well, I'm actually, I'm actually going as a support diver for Nicholas Remy, who's arguably much better at photography than than anything I'm going to ever be able to achieve. Um, <laughs> so I'm I'm the lighting bitch. I get to put the strobe lights out and then possibly be the diver in the shot when he needs it when he needs it for those those big aircraft and tanks and whatnot. So it's going to be going to be a lot of fun. I think. Amazing. Mm. And we definitely go dive the power station. Oh really? That's the one, is it? Yeah. I'm going to write that down. The power station. Yeah, it's so so about twenty. Ugh probably way more than that 35 50 years ago um they needed to run a line for electricity between jordan and egypt and of course what would be the best way than take massive metal pipes and just lay them on the reef yeah. um that would be right the best way to do that i mean they blew up a bunch of the reef and then put the power station then you've got the the um uh like the poles i oh, like the foundations and stuff i guess that's they're called yeah, exactly, and that's underwater, mm. right? And then you've got these massive, massive, massive metal uh, tubes. Now, obviously, as we all know, corals really like current, mm. so that made that dive site awesome. Awesome. I'm definitely going to look at that one then. We've got a few extra days before the competition itself to get out there and do a bit of mooching and, and exploring. So, yes, good air. Good cool. air. Power station, I've got it written down. Right, let's, let's bring it back round to the <laughs> Philippines, shall we? Now, you did mention uh, very Please. briefly that you are, um, well, for want of a better phrase, Mrs. Atlantis Philippines. Um, <laughs> and part of the reason that we've not been able definitely to... Married to... Definitely married to that, as my, <laughs> my partner would say. <laughs> yeah, so he's still in bed thinking, oh, God, she's still doing more work on that Atlantis stuff, yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the re main reasons that we've not been able to get this talk done or this chat done uh, and a, a few cancellations is because you're zipping around all over the place going to uh, dive events and dive shows and and promoting Atlantis so I think I think it's over to you where, what's the best or where do you want to start with Atlantis because there's quite a bit about it isn't there yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah well first of all it's been around for a while so yep. 33 years um, yeah, and um, you know, I think if 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 it's all right with you, I'd like to start with the Philippines. Hell yeah, you go for it. Yeah, exactly. So I first came to the Philippines uh, thirteen years ago, maybe twelve. Okay, I don't know. It's blurry. That kind <laughs> of a long time ago as a dive guide, um, and I came from the Caribbean. And a lot of people said, oh, when you go to Asia, you'll see when you go to Asia, you'll see when you go to Asia. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, because I think the Caribbean is good. Mm. You can't, you know, you got a great variety of corals. It's warm, which is very important um, for lots of us divers, except for you guys, people down there. Oh, um, uh, so <laughs> great visibility, you know, just generally good conditions, right? And a really good variety of, of marine life. Mm. Uh, lots of sharks you can see in different various places, reefs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I, I remember I was a bit skeptic. I really was because you know you're coming from good diving and you're thinking, hmm. Um, and then I went there. I was a dive guide in Bohol. That was the first place I worked okay. um, in a small dive shop. And uh, I remember going into the water. There, one of the uh, owners. There were two partners. One of the owners was a marine biologist, a German guy. And uh, we went in there and. I was mind blown mm. by the colors, by the variety, by the number of species. I couldn't even recognize what they were. Yeah. So that kind of goes to, okay, I guess this is Asia for you. <laughs> um, and, and, and it was incredible. It was incredible. And it was, I think, very, very rich in macro life, which is kind of a different way of looking at diving. Um, a lot of people would say when they ask about um, dive certs and kind of the experience of a diver that you need to be, people talk about the conditions and the water. I think it also relates to how many dives you have mm -hmm. because no, newer divers generally would not appreciate macro. 
No. And and of course, it's like a child, right? You need your the colors and the reefs and all the and the, the schools of fish and big stuff to get super excited. And then after you've done about I don't know a few hundreds of those, you go, ooh, interesting, a frogfish. You know that mm. tiny thing can change its color completely between ten and eighteen hours. How cool is that? Mm. You know things that you don't even think about, and then you start focusing more about you know on animal behavior, on in different traits, and how species on the, from our macro our critters actually need to adapt. And that I think what a little bit blew my mind. Of course, there's big stuff as well. I mean, it, it was my uh, first time ever seeing um, a mother and a cub whale shark. Mm-hmm just swimming together which is unreal i mean the cup is is, is, is massive <laughs> it's big it's already massive. yeah <laughs> yeah it's pretty big already it's like five or something six meters or something like that, five meters so mm. yeah it was very very interesting variety so that was the philippines for me then i went and um lived and worked on Cavigan, which is quite a small island um in the north of mindanao what, what um, island is that sorry and really what island Camigan. 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 Where's that? Kamigan, or as we call it, come again. <laughs> amazing, amazing place. Tiny, tiny, tiny. The highest ratio of peaks per square kilometers in the world, more than Hawaii. It's got seven peaks. Uh, the road around the island is 64 kilometers. So it's, you know, you go around it in an hour, maybe on a two, an hour and a half on a motorbike. Um, really, oh. really, really interesting uh, place to be in terms of nature. Uh, it's in the, the north part of Mindanao. So you ride a, yes, yeah, C-A-M-I. G U I N. C A M I. Which is probably. Uh, G U I N. G U I N, which is probably not. <laughs> yes, yeah, probably not how you spelled it. Um, and okay. so, yes, yeah, yeah. so that was pretty, pretty nice diving as well. Yeah, pretty nice diving, but a lot of nature and serenity. And that's the other thing in the Philippines that, you know, obviously this is a scuba diving podcast and we talk about <laughs> everything about scuba diving, but the, the nature in the Philippines is astounding yeah uh, we're not just talking about nature in terms of beaches right i mean there are volcanoes with mineral like in Camigan, there is a mineral water pool <laughs> that you swim in uh there are hot springs all over the place you know waterfalls it's just very very untouched wild nature um yes it's mostly tropical climate and there's not things at elevation other than in luzon which is the main island uh, in an area called Baguio, they grow strawberries. Okay. So it actually does get cold. You know, it's just such a great variety of, of topside and underwater. Mm. And I think that's what really got me hooked on the Philippines um, since then. Mm. Mm. Uh, so when the opportunity came and we were living in Costa Rica and the opportunity came to go back to the Philippines, I was like, ooh, yes. How did that uh, because come I about? Think also Is it, the was people it something are... you saw advertised or something like that? Actually, yes. So we were uh, kind of looking at options at the time uh, and I wanted to get back in the diving world and um, an opportunity rose uh, with Atlantis. Mm. So, yep. And you applied. Just literally and were looking at a, swiftly on an the ad for, yay. <laughs> uh, not that swiftly when you've got a one-year-old. It takes a while to... <laughs> if you don't move as quickly, then it's just you and your scuba gear, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah but it was a really it was a really good chance and i I actually applied for a position to run a resort which i'm really happy i uh, didn't get and didn't end up in because the operational side is less uh, where my passion lies and um yeah and then we went back to the philippines uh we lived in dumaguete which is on the island of negros Mm -hmm. um for about four years which is where one of the resorts is located um Excellent. It's called the, it's the Mecca of uh, crater diving in the Philippines. It's black volcanic sand. Mm-hmm. So it's dark as sand. So we get different kind of critters. Uh, it's a mixed area of sandy slopes, uh, s- small patches of hardcore reefs and uh, artificial reefs, which brings crazy critters. There's seven different species of, of frogfish, for example, including the hairy frogfish. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, you know, we had... Um, there's Apple Island, which is 45 minutes from the resort, which has a really, really interesting story. It's the first and longest lasting community led marine protected area in the Philippines. Okay. So uh, it's, got, it's got one of the fastest growing corals in the world as studied uh, by the California Academy of Science. 
and um, it's got over 150 species of coral and 300 species of fish. So and it's, it's so a, small. I'm just looking on the map here. And it's, yeah, it's it is, it is. And you've got a wall, a wall, and a coral garden. It's tiny. It's got about 1,000 people living there with no running water and no electricity. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's quite an interesting community. That's a community that is heavily relying on fishing. Yeah. Uh, but with, um, oof, this could be a topic for a totally different podcast, but um, in the 70s, there was a national scientist um, uh, called Angel Alcala, which uh, actually passed away last year um, or earlier this year. Um, he, is, he studied the relationship, which of course seemed very obvious to us these days, the relationship between... Um, uh, devastating fishing methods like dynamite fishing, morami, you know, nets and all that mm -hmm. uh, to the population of fish in the surrounding areas. So, of course, what he was able to prove, literally scientifically, is that fish in stress reproduce less. Ta da! Yeah. I mean, obviously, this also applies to us people, right? If you're laying at home and there are missiles over your head, um, <laughs> You know, you're less likely wanting to have sex and to have more kids. Uh -huh. uh, it's just a, a kind of an inter, internal defense mechanism, I yeah, guess. Yeah. And so when he was able to prove that, he was able to go to the Upper Island community and say, look, guys, we're depleting the ocean. The people who are going to get hurt of it the most are you because you are solely dependent on fishing. Mm. So slowly, slowly, 10 uh, percent of the water around Upper Island became a no take zone to let fish actually reproduce and grow, mm -hmm. um, basically. Uh, and then slowly now, 100% of the water around it is obviously there's no dynamite fishing and none of that. It's all line fishing. There's no net fishing. And it took 40 years, less than 40 years, and, and the reefs are in incredible. Yeah. Is it, is, I, I'm, I might be completely wrong here, uh, as I often am, but is it Apo Island where they um, – where, where, You've got to be Filipino to be able to fish there. I thought there's somewhere, there's somewhere, I'm, I'm not sure, there's somewhere that you cannot fish as a foreigner. You have to be a local. And I'm not sure whether it's Philippines or Malaysia, to be honest. Uh, I think on coastal diving, you wouldn't see a lot of uh, commercial fishing. There's no commercial fishing license um, mm. performed or on coastal diving. So on the boats, the, the, the go close to shore. But I think in the Philippines, you got to remember that most of the fishing, not in terms of catch quantity, but in terms of the number of people engaging in that industry. It's about a million Filipinos per day just go on in their little bunka, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically a, a wooden or a fiberglass or a bamboo boat with the two, um, with that outriggers. two kind of bamboo ba outriggers on the side, no motor, no anything, just push themselves to shore and, and push themselves a little bit into the ocean and, and fish. So mm. that's about a million people a day that do that so in terms of numbers yeah i mean and those are obviously not licensed or anything yeah yeah well i think they're, they're i think they're entitled to go fishing aren't they if they're living off it yes yeah i think that yeah they are uh the one place for example like palau is very interesting being a shark sanctuary but uh technically if you're palauan you are allowed to fish a shark really yes palauans and palauans only Okay. To the best of my knowledge, it may have changed. I haven't lived there in about uh, eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'm starting to build a little um, path through the Philippines on where I need to be <laughs> going and landing and diving. There you go. Yeah. Let's flick back up to uh, oh Dumagati for a moment because you've got the resort there, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Atlantis actually has two scuba diving, uh, dedicated scuba diving resorts uh -huh. that makes it a really big difference than um, some other operations in the Philippines because uh, we are a dedicated dive resort. We're not a resort that offers diving and yoga and tree hugging and activities and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's a scuba diving resort. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is good, which is good. We like trees. I, I, I'm happy <laughs> with trees above and underwater. Um, yeah, so it's basically, um, it's a, it's a very different kind of operation. And I do remember that from, um, so I used to work for Sam's Tours in Palau. Sam's Tours obviously doesn't have a resort attached to it, but it's a, it's a massive dive shop mm. where of course there's some other tours like snorkeling and kayaking and land tours. But that moment at like 4.30 when all the boats get back 
and, and dozens of divers spill from the boats and sit down in the bar and everybody talks about diving. And it's like people are, are you're living the experience way beyond the, the time you spent underwater. Like think about that for a minute, really. I mean, diving in Palau, for example, or most other destinations where you do two tanks a day. Okay, you start your day probably around 6 a.m. to get ready to breakfast. So, you know, you don't go horizontal when your breakfast is coming up, right? <laughs> so you, you kind of like start your day super early and then five, you know, by the time you get to the dive shop, get set your gear, briefing, go on the boat, travel, whatever long that takes, come back, da 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 da. And you just chunk like, I don't know, 12 hour days mm. and all you spend underwater is two hours. Yeah. That's, right? Uh, so there's everything, everything that arounds it makes a difference. It makes a difference. The people you spend on the boat, how long are the boat rides? Are they comfortable? Are they in a place where there is some, some nice scenery or are you just suffering for whatever long from rain and, and wind? You know, the, all that thing makes a big, big, big difference. What would be, a, and I think, you what know, would be a, a typical day then? Let's say I was staying at Dumaguete and I wanted to go dive in through the day and then have a beer at the night time with a whiskey nightcap. Ah, Fill in the bits your mind's going to be blown. <laughs> yeah. From when I get up in the morning to when I get back to that bar, what's what's a, what's the schedule generally yeah. look like? So we offer in both resorts. We've got one resort in Dumaguete and one in Porto Galera, which is on uh, Sabang Beach. Um, one of the, in my opinion, one of the best diving destinations in the Philippines. Okay. Not because I work for Atlantis, because I do the Philippines. I can't even say I've been to 10% of it, right? It's 7,641 islands. Yeah. But, um, you know, I did dive the, the main area is both for work and for fun. Um, so I'm still one of those that when I have a vacation, I take a diving. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in, in other locations, then we, we operate. Um, yeah, so it's definitely uh, one of the best dive destinations for me in the Philippines, just in terms of variety of, of topography, walls and swim throughs and canyons and sandy slopes and heaps of corals and just wow. Mm. Uh, so we, in both resorts, we offer five guided boat dives per day. Okay. Um, so the idea is like live aboard but on land. So you wake up in the morning, you have an amazing breakfast, uh, no buffet style, everything is a la carte. Food is a very important thing at Atlantis. Uh, thank God for that, because as you know, the army and divers uh, march on their stomach. <laughs> have you uh, seen you the size of me? Perfect dive. <laughs> yeah. That's takes a beer. It takes a lot of fuel to get this <laughs> tank moving, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I think it's a, it's a very important aspect because you can have a great dive vacation. I've seen that when I went on vacation. And, you know, I'm, I've got my special dietary requirements. I don't like to eat. Um, you know, we're vegetarian, pretty strict vegetarians, no seafood, none of that. So uh, don't like things to be super fried. So there are places where you go where you're challenged. Yeah. Where you're challenged. Yeah. So that's very, very important to have a good base of diet because that affects your mood, um, obviously, during the day. So you've got uh, a really nice breakfast, 22 menu items, including um, stone cut oatmeal and things like it, that. So what? anything, you know, for any sort of flavor. Stone, stone cut. cut oatmeal. What the hell is that? Yeah oatmeal it's like when you take the oatmeal and you you crack the shield of it yeah with actual stones yeah okay keeps the keeps the, sh the shell on it and it's supposed to be more nutritional okay you know, it's cooking a lot with coconut oil uh, a lot of local produce mm. um, things like that starting your morning with an amazing fruit platter because the philippines has Definitely the best pineapples in the world, undebatingly the best pineapples <laughs> in the world, and I've tested them, um, and uh, and definitely incredible mangoes. Yeah. yeah. So there's a fruit platter you start with, and then after that, you know, we do uh, two dives in the morning, mm -hmm. so eight thirty and ten thirty, and then two dives in the afternoon, two and four and six o'clock for a night dive because it does get dark uh, between five thirty and six mm -hmm. every day, year round. Um, so the, um, the, the the dives through the day. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to chip in every now and then just to I'll, I'll sure. forget the questions if I don't. So, is, is there any kind of uh, time limits on on the dives, and are they done from shore, or do you go out on a boat, or? They're all guided boat dives, okay. and a few reasons for that. Uh, number one, first and foremost, is safety. Yep. 
um, of course, which we take very seriously. Uh, and second is because there's a lot of macro life. And if you mm -hmm. dive there for the first time and you don't know where to look, because as you know, when you're looking at critters, you need to know the habitat, you need to know where to look for stuff. So if you don't know where to look, uh, you won't necessarily find all this all, all these incredible critters. So uh, we do have uh, all of our uh, guides are uh, local Filipinos and homegrown. So from whatever role they do at the resort, from restaurant to driver to tank boy, if you want to pursue a career in diving, that is an option for you mm -hmm. at Atlantis. We don't hire uh, what we used to be me, you know, that foreign instructor that comes in on a two year contract and scoops <laughs> lots of tips and, and off they go and leave the low paying job, the low paying jobs to the locals. Yeah. So there's none of that. Um, everybody is local. Mm. And so they're guided bow dives. So yes, there's 60 minutes limit because you've got five of those a day. Um, and the the biggest uh, difference also is that we don't dive from bunker boats. So we don't take the big outrigger boats. We normally dive from small speed boats. So the travel time to the dive sites is one to five minutes, Bloody literally. Hell. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... for people who don't like the rocking sea, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, Ronnie out at Spice Island Divers in Ambon, he does something very similar. I mean, the, the travel terms are a little bit more extended but uh, definitely a, a speed boat and then drop in and i just want to pick up on that point yeah. though you you said about the um, dive guides being local um you can't get better mm -hmm. in my opinion you cannot get better you know any any foreigner any international dive guide that comes in and reckons that they're better than the locals is talking right out of their asshole it's yeah i think absolutely absolutely i think knowing the water when you grow there um, is totally different. Mm. Um, I think some of the, you'd see sometimes the advantage to having a foreign dive guide is that you'd get, you can get your marine biologists, right, to come in and they have an extensive knowledge on the, on the background of the scenery, mm. right? So there's a bit more of an education uh, point to it. But you get that with staff retention. Yeah. I mean, we've got people working at Atlantis for 10 years, right? There's in Dumaguete, for example, which is where I was based, there's three couples who met in the resort, married in, in our family, right? <laughs> so still both of them work at the resort. Yeah. So, you know, you get that when you get people who dive those beaches each and every day and year round, then you have that knowledge being built. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a very important point, other than the fact that even outside of the dive guides, you know, management level, everybody, there's a 154 people at Atlantis. And I think we're seven foreigners including the owners 154 that's that's over the three like that. elements we're talking about here the two resorts and the liverboard or yeah that's the two resorts and the liverboard yeah yeah yep that's... so the resorts are medium size there's 40 room in Porto Galera and 44 in Dumaguete and 16 uh, passengers and eight cabins on the boat so that's a shit ton of tanks yeah <laughs> different <laughs> sizes too <laughs> All being is inspected and uh, cleaned and serviced regularly. Yes, that is a shit ton of tanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, do we get the? Um, is there any? What's the? What's the go-to macro? Because I know I'm a bit of a macro head, and I think you. It, I mean, you mentioned it earlier on. As people progress in their diving, um, you kind of get used to seeing. Oh, look, look, there's a shark again. There's a big cuttlefish. There's a. It's all same same, and then you start to see. Uh, you know that extra new world that's in the in the, the tiny little crevices of the the corals so i found in the locations that i've gone so far on my macro hunts is that each destination has its own kind of celebrities um who's the who would you say is the most sought after at dumaguete when you've got photographers and macro heads coming in uh, the different species of octopus. First of all, blue ring octopus is on everybody's list, yeah. right? People come, that's what I want to see. I want to see blue ring octopus. And it's really funny when they say that because you go, oh, really? <laughs> that's it. okay. Just put your head in the water. Now, now to, now to, eh, yeah, I mean, look, obviously, you know, you don't make promises. It's the ocean, but most people stay with us for about a week and then it is, it is likely and hopeful that they'll see one. So, uh, definitely uh, the blue ring, the matoti is also one of them. Wonderpus. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. Wonderpus and mimic they? octopus are also, yeah, mm. fantastic. Not just for photographers, for anyone, just to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're 
mind blowing. <laughs> um, the flamboy we get a lot of the flamboyant cuttlefish, and we do get a lot of uh, fish behavior in the Philippines in general because if you don't have strong currents, then it's you know you can spend some time and go really really slow mm. and kind of look at the different critters as you go along. So, uh, for example, you can see the flamboyant cuttlefish hunting, which is okay. quite amazing. You know, they walk and they got that tongue coming yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, which is which is really really cool. So you know, there's a lot of that going on. So I think, uh, yeah, I think blue ring octopus, uh, pygmy seahorse is another one people are fanatic about. Mm -hmm. And in Porta Galera, actually, we've got a really good shot going back to photographers uh, because we've got these uh, massive sea fans in a dive site called Canyons, and it's about 16 meters, and you get them, which is pretty shallow, and then you can get that shot on a on a sunny day with yeah. the blue kind of like really bright blue in the background so that's pretty rare i don't shoot myself at all uh but you know i um that people get really excited over that it's those little buggers that i think i think it was don that mentioned it a few episodes ago you you, you get so focused on getting photos of those little buggers they're they're the prime um, cause for going into decompression uh <laughs> The amount of times that oh I've my gone God, into decode totally. and not realized. Yeah. And he's the same. Because <laughs> you're, you're chasing after, you're, you're just chasing after that photo, yeah. you know, of a pygmy seahorse or of a of a frogfish. Um, frogfish are kind of easier to photograph or, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Different, just different kind of stuff. The mantis shrimp with the eggs. Oh, you get yes. the peacock mantis shrimp. And if you're lucky with the eggs on the belly, you know, it's that kind of stuff. Mm. Mandarin fish. So... Yeah, there's a lot of uh, really good variety. Um, and I think, to me, the reason Porta Galera is so amazing is you've got that plus the reefs. Okay. And that's that creates a very, very special destination because mostly people kind of like have to choose, you know, macro or reef, right? Mm. Um, of course, where there is reef, there is macro. So, you know, there is, but it's not necessarily the focus. Like I just got back from Tubataha where... People were trying to, you know, people were sh pointing nudibranchs to each other. And I'm just like, show me a nudibranch. Oh, no, you know, this is not the reason I'm here. <laughs> but um, people get excited over those, right? Yeah. So there are over 700 species of nudibranchs in Porta Galera. Uh, really, really, really interesting. Uh, and then you've got the amazing topography, the wall, the, the swim throughs, canyons, big boulders that go down completely covered in corals. So it's just very, very uh, interesting mix of... Um, dive sites and this is Porto Galera, yeah? yeah yeah which is off the coast of Mindoro uh northern part of Mindoro which is the next island south from Luzon the main island where Manila is so you take a van for about an hour and a half uh to a place called Batangas and then uh either take a public ferry or a private speedboat which is 30 minutes and you're at the resort mm -hmm. oh yeah just found it yep so that was one of the areas in the Philippines where Philippines started be, uh, becoming a scuba diving destination in the 90s. Mm -hmm. This is one of the places where everybody went to. And actually, it's really interesting because Aussies went there a lot. Yeah. And when you talk to people about Porta Galera when you were down in Australia, people would be like, oh, haven't been there in ages. You know, <laughs> people know it. It is because it is that. And then I think there was some sort of a shift towards other destinations like like the Visayas region where Dumaguete is part of, like Bohol, Cebu, mm -hmm. uh, Negros, kind of that area, you know, with the threshers in Malapascua and the sardines in Malwal and kind of everything started coming down a little bit. Of course, there's Tubataha, right? Yeah. Um, and those are the famous destinations, but they're, you know, they're way more. They're way, way more. Mm. Come on then, give us a lowdown on... Um... On Porta Galera, then what's the? You say it's about an hour on a bus. Did you say to get to Batangas? So it's an yeah, it's an hour and a half hour uh, and to a half. two, depending on traffic. But normally it's about a hundred and a hour and a half. Mm. Uh, we do private vans from Manila, and then you can either hop on a public ferry, which is about ninety minutes, uh, sixty to ninety, depending on the boat, uh, and or you take the private water taxi, mm. um, which takes you to the resort in thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah. so. So it runs on about three hours, which is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, depending on arrival time, people either spend the night in Manila and go early in the morning or land, uh, you know, in the morning and then off to the resort. Straight in a bus and away you go. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. 
Um, yeah, and then same thing there. Like it's uh, we've got twenty seven dive spots that are one to five minutes away. From boat. <laughs> crazy it's like ridiculous sometimes you get on a boat and it's really funny because you know you'd get on a boat and then they would drive boop, and people said seriously i could have swam that <laughs> i'm like yeah you know uh, so everything is just there like one of my best night dives was just in front of the resort and we saw uh, i'm not exaggerating a spanish dancer this big really? it was ridiculous like all of us were just <laughs> staring at it i didn't think it was a spanish dancer i, I was like this can't be this can't be she's way too big yeah but um yeah and no one got photo so that's, proof because that, they that had macro lenses of... on hmm, possibly some i think <laughs> somebody did i think i don't know i definitely have it in my very vividly in my mind going what are you who yeah. is this Bloody hell. must have uh you know must have been fed well at atlantis in the <laughs> breakfast <laughs> Awesome source. Now we yep. we have we do have a link, don't we? We have um, we have the boat, the liverboard. Yeah, the liverboard. Yes. So yes, Atlantis Azores, uh, built in the eighties in Louisiana for the oil rigger industry, turned into a dive boat by aggressor. Uh, Atlantis bought it in twenty twelve, put okay. it back in the water in twenty fourteen. Uh, she's, she carries 16 passengers and eight cabins. Uh, we do four routes a year, mm -hmm. depending on the time of year. Uh, Tubataha is one of them. And then we spend six months in the Visayas, which we leave uh, from, from Atlantis to Maggette. So that's pretty easy for in terms of combination. Like you stay a couple nights at the resort, then you get on the boat and, you know, zero transfers there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we do the Visayas route. We go to yeah, either kind of like southern Visayas or including Malapascua to go dive with the Threshers. Where's uh, which on, makes let me just have a look at my map again. Where's the Visayas on the map? So if you look at the chunk of islands that are Negros, Cebu, Bohol, Sikihor, and then there's Iloilo, but that's kind of a you know not a touristy destination. Yeah. Uh, so those are called the Visayas. Uh, okay. Visayas region. Yeah, and that's really famous and popular for diving. Mm -hmm. So uh, just because you get a really good variety from thresher sharks to whale sharks to sardines to macro to walls to, yeah, there's everything, yeah. everything. And the movement between islands is quite easy because they're all kind of like, you know, an hour ferry away from each other. Yeah. Uh, makes it really simple. It's kind of like combining on a dive trip. It's kind of like combining Anilao and Porta Galera, right? Because okay. they're close to each other. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we do different routes there, including up to Malapascua, which makes quite a big difference when you dive it off the liverboard. It's an early morning dive on a cleaning station. Uh, when you do it from uh, land-based shops, it's going to be you and 20 other boats. Yeah, I've been there. By and large, it's a very popular <laughs> destination. Or you do it off the liverboard, you know, half an hour before everyone else as you wake up and roll over. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I do, um, I obviously remember know the dives and, and seeing the sharks which was awesome however the the, the the one thing i do remember most of malapasco was the amount of fucking cockles in the morning 3 4 a.m or something like that. That, was, that no one warned me about it it was a bit that's, of a shocker that's philippines for you it's just <laughs> uh, yeah they're everywhere they're everywhere the filipinos love their chickens and of course they love their cocks and their cock bites and yeah. all that stuff so yes there is uh yeah, there is a lot of that. It's funny, like when you live there, you kind of get oblivious to it. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, obviously, a lot, a lot of people talk about it when they, uh, when they go there on vacation. They're like, "Oh my God, there's so many uh, roosters!" And we're like, "Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. Yes." Yeah, but not so many on the boat, which is a good thing. No, no roosters on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> So let, let, just um, Try those, those routes again only... that you do. So you got four routes here. So you do uh, Tubataha. Yeah. So we do Tubataha between. Uh, you know, so we start last week of February through mid June, uh -huh. and then we move the boat to the Visayas, and then there's a transition trip between from Tubataha to Dumaguete. Gotcha. And then we do the routes around the Visaya, either like a seven night kind of Bohol area, so Dumaguete. Uh, Oslo for the whale sharks, Sumilan, Mualbal. Actually, no, we don't do Mualbal. We do Kabilau um, and um, other islands around that area, mm. uh, just from the typhoon a couple of years ago. And, no, I think uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that 
having a, a liverboard. How many other liverboards are in, in that region? Instantly. Very interesting question, you know, and it's, I just had that talk with a bunch of people um, on the last show I've been to. Uh, you would think that Philippines would have hundreds of boats with you would, over 7,000 islands. No, there's about 20 liveaboards. Jesus. How weird is that? It's like That's only 20 liveaboards, that right? And there's only, s not at all, and there's only six of us all metal boats. Right, so when you go out to open sea, that's a bit uh, more stable and safer. Yeah, just a um, bit. So yeah, just a tad. So yeah, there's there's there that. So there's really not that many boats in the Philippines, uh, which is uh, surprising, mm. incredible. Uh, I think because especially in places like Tubataha, you get a very exquisite experience. Uh, the the park is huge, and you cannot anchor, so you have to moor. Right. And this also same same in the Visayas, like in a lot of these places, we try not to throw anchor. We try to moor if it's a if it's a route that we, you know, we normally go to mm. um, and other, you know, different boats, different mooring lines into which the park does. But in different areas, we put mooring lines out of put out of boats, put mooring lines. And we normally try not to be two boats in the same area in the same time. Right. Oh, OK. Um, and so that creates a pretty exquisite experience. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was going to be my follow up question to see if um, see if all the boats follow the same kind of routes and the the same kind of schedules throughout the year. I think they do. I think most boats do. However, because it's such a huge region, I mean, honestly, like other than Tubataha, which is one marine park, the rest of it is just massive. Yeah. So you don't have to be in the same place where other boats are. Yeah. And that's that's really a big, you know, my husband just got back from Raja Ampat and he also said they haven't seen that many boats because that area is also really big yeah. and the boats do coordinate. But there's 120 liveaboards in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. And like mm -hmm. 160 in the Maldives. I mean, well, it's you know, just... the, you know, the Indonesian ones that do Komodo, they do Komodo through the Komodo season and then they all piss off over to Raja right. Ampat and they're all there as well. Um it's the same for us with Tubataha, except yeah. we're like less than 20 boats, you know, so <laughs> just yes. a very, very different, very different experience, I think. Um, and I think, I think, you know, the, the being, being able to have those moments when you dive, that's, and again, going back to being an experienced divers, you know, I went to the Red Sea last year after I haven't been there in 20 years. Mm. Um, dove, you know, daily boats, uh, did, uh, from Sharem did um what did we do tehran straits one day and ras muhammad another day there were 44 day boats each of them with like between 20 and 40 divers holy shit I, we i literally went in the water and they grouped us together there was us uh uh you know my partner and i my dad and they grouped us with this group of four Portuguese who actually work at dive center because they figured, oh, shoot, you know, let's put the dive professionals together. And, you know, our guide looked at us and said, look, we're going to do, you know, we're going to jump here. Are you guys okay with swimming a little bit? Because then we're going to get off the crowds. And when we would meet the crowds, I was shocked. There were like dozens of divers in the water and there's bubbles everywhere and there's people everywhere. I just kind of went, ooh, it just swam off to the blue. You know, mm. this is not especially as you become more experienced um, in your diving, not as a career, just as a diver, these are the kind of experiences you're looking for, right? Correct, correct. You need that, um, that feel of getting away from the madding crowd. And to be able to see the critters and mm. the big stuff, because mm. they normally don't like the big crowds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was generally first in the water and you get to see the good stuff and it all buggers off before the last group gets yep. in. So it's, yeah, no. That's the secret. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, hey, I did notice, and I think anyone who's listening to this will know already, but Tubataha is um, extremely popular. And um, as Ronnie's already said, it's uh, very limited on when you can go and dive it. What's the lead time on people wanting to get on board of the boat for Tubataha at the moment. Oh my, my we're sold out this season. Uh, and then next year, we only have a few spaces and a one week left. Yeah. So literally yeah. two years in advance kind of thing. 
a year to two at minimum, unless you want to wait last. This is for the good boats. This yeah. is for the good boats, okay? Yeah. Unless you want to wait for last minute cancellations, which, you know, there's a space here, there's a space there, but I think lots of people are like, look, I got to take my leave. It's a week. Uh, we also do seven nights uh, versus, uh, versus six nights, which most other boats do. Mm. Um, to get another trip in. So we do 22 dives into the Taha. And um, yeah. So, you know, I think, yeah, definitely a year to two. Yeah, yeah. I'll start getting my name down now, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I, this is really that, you know, people would contact me and be like, hey, you know, we want to take, we want to do a full charter uh, next year. I'm like, Haha, okay, we're taking bookings for 2026 now for full charters. Yeah. Are you really? Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the good boats, it's it's very, very different. It's a very different world. And granted that it's a 14-week, 15-week season, mm. half of that season is filled with our repeaters. Um, so people come back every year. Yeah. Uh, for example, dive shops would be would do a Dubataha trip every year, not necessarily with the same people, but because people want to go, then they would book that in advance. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And it holds 16 people, did you say? 16 people, yep. Okay. Eight I'm, cabins. I, I need to yep. nail something down then, don't I? Which is quite an exquisite... Yeah, it's quite an exquisite... Again, going back to the fact that no two boats are in the same place. Mm. Uh, if you have a boat with 24 people or a boat with 16 people, it makes a big difference, right? Mm. Well, I, I mean, I kind of know what you're talking about with Tupataha, but for those people that are listening, do you want to nail down why it is so popular i'm just sitting here thinking oh hold on a minute there, there will be people who are not sure what that location is what's so popular about tubata right so it's there are two atolls in the middle of the sulu sea they're 90 nautical miles away from any land mm. uh they're the largest marine park uh, in southeast asia um i think yeah size wise size wise uh, and they're very, very well protected. They're, the atolls are, have drop-offs. So the plateau, depending on the current, on the tides, would be anywhere from, you know, 10 to 18 meters on the plateau. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it drops to walls of like 900,000 meters. <laughs> so very, very deep, very, very blue um, currents, you know. So everything that comes through the Philippines, if you, if you open the map of the Philippines, that kind of takes it back to why the Philippines is so special. If you open the map of the Philippines, you will notice that it's situated between the Pacific Ocean and basically four large bodies of water. So the Pacific Ocean on the east, uh, Sulu, Celebes Sea and Sulu Sea on the southwest, and then the north West Philippine Sea or South China Sea, depending who you ask, mm -hmm. same sea, different names, um, <laughs> on the northwest. So those four large bodies of water, basically water from the open ocean, rich in nutrients, come in and funnel through the islands of the Philippines. So we're also on a meeting point of two major oceanic currents, which is the North Equatorial Current and the Pacific Current. So again, water from open ocean come in, rich in nutrients and go between the islands, right? The channels between the islands are normally around anywhere from 100 to 300 meters deep. So there's a lot of water, right? And then yeah. the nutrients obviously settle kind of like on the, on the, on the walls or slopes of the island, um, islands uh, to create really, really rich habitats. And that's why also our corals are the fastest growing corals in the world. It's because there is a temperature difference. Um, you know, even with global warming, the water does not get a 30 degrees Celsius for a long period where it damages the corals, right? Mm -hmm. It's It funnels. The water funnels and colder water. Like I was just in Tubataha in April and we had some upswell, like 25 Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> So, that's, that's positively toasty down here. This is here. for us. <laughs> oh my God, for us it's like, like we don't, you know, we don't, ooh, I wouldn't even go diving in that kind of temperature. But, <laughs> uh, you know, you get those currents coming in. And so that what makes it so, you know, biodiverse and healthy, right? Mm. So Tubataha is that with the drop-offs, just insane corals, insane, insane. They see fans that are like three meter diameters and, and just, Everything is big, everything is colorful, you know, lots of schools. Um, so there is that. And of course, the fact that you can't get there makes it lucrative, right? Like, yeah. why do people, um, I don't know, who's a, who's a top model these days? Man, I'm like so off, off the beat. 
you. Of course. That's why Matt Waters is so desirable. And that's why it takes so long to schedule a podcast with him because there's only one of him and everybody wants it. Go, you know, so that's Tubataha. Matt, you are Tubataha. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just having a look on the map here and I'll put it on the old um, you know yep. Google thing that shows you the the, old the topography and it's yeah. um it's actually very interesting that you can see how that um those channels like you say that are going to be bringing that nutrient rich water through and it it all sits on one big spine well yeah well just have a look not only at tubataha so hmm. have a quick look at uh the verde passage verde passage verde right passage. so that is basically the point yeah between verde island um, and uh, the middle of it is Verde Island, which is after incredible studies has been proven to be the number one um, most biodiverse point in the world. Okay. Which one's Verde this Island? Is Where is it from, of Science. From, from so just Google, just Google Verde Island. No, don't look at Kubataha. This is a totally different destination. Okay. Uh, go to just Google Verde Island. Do it in it. And when you'll find it, you will, you will find it very shortly. And when you find it, you will learn that this uh, bugger is uh, located in the middle of the Verde Passage. Oh, this is up near Porta the, Galera, yeah. There you go, right? So you've got Anilau, you've got Porta Galera. Yeah. And in that area is uh, Verde Island, so uh, the most biodiverse point in uh, the Philippines, uh, as the Cate California Academy of Sciences uh, declared okay. uh, after their study. And what makes it so unique um, is the fact that it sits, if you look at where it's sitting, going back to this discussion about currents, mm -hmm. if you look at where it's sitting, right, it's sitting, you can see that the water is coming in from... Um, the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea, right? We've just been to yeah. this discussion. So that's where the water's coming in. That's, so that's these a, guys... a good funnel as well, isn't it? Exactly. So what you get there is currents. Currents that come in, water rich in nutrients, everything kind of like funnels through that channel, that passage, we call it a passage, and then that goes straight into the area of the inner islands like Romblon, etc., etc. So... It's the same thing in Tubataha if you look at the, at the location of it. Mm. Yeah, because water comes in really rich in nutrients and then they find these two atolls and then you've got all these corals, right? So that's where your habitat becomes very uh, unique, yeah. right? Um, and so that it's true, it's true. And I will kid you not, Verde Island is one of the best, best, hands down, dive sites. It is okay. unreal. It's pinnacles rising up from 150 meters, going all the way to the surface. You can only see the tip. So you see this tip triangle of black rocks, mm. right? And then it goes down like this, dunk, and then there's a little plateau, and then boom, and then the wall goes down to about hundreds of meters deep. Mm. There are clouds, clouds of red tooth triggerfish. It's <laughs> unreal. It's unreal. It's, it's like a dream. It's a dream. And every time I go there, I just go, oh, my God. And it's really funny because like I told you, I just got back into Bataha a second time. And I was literally diving through this cloud of red tooth triggerfish. And I just went, you know, the same feeling. So, yes, of course, Tubataha is amazing. It's amazing because it's remote. Yeah. It's amazing because there's no people. There's no land. <laughs> You're on a boat for a week. You get off the boat once to go on land. Yeah. That's not even on land. It depends on the tides, right? So we go to the ranger station to visit the rangers. But obviously, you know, their, their house is a house on, on, on stilts. So on low tide, it's just nothing. Yeah. Right. So it's just water, 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 and some more water. So that experience is really unique. Um, and of course, the size of the corals and just a variety of, of there's heaps of sharks everywhere, everywhere. That's what I was going to ask next is the, the sharks, what kind of sharks. And I've got a, there's one chap, he's a good mate now. He started out as a, uh, a guest and um, mm -hmm. he's only ever happy when he sees something, you know, big. 
<laughs> Some, sharky. Yeah. <laughs> you can be on the best right, dive so, in the world. They'd be like, yeah, it's, it's okay. But if a shark turns up, he's got a big cheesy grin on his face. <laughs> right. So I think sharks in the Philippines, look, on coastal diving, we don't get that much. Yeah. For the obvious reasons. A million reasons. Filipinos for obvious reasons, right? And, you know, obvious reasons that also go back to our dive industry because, you know, like, again, I, I'm not, and there's no judgment in what I'm going to say. Uh, but you do go and people go on vacation. They would sort of be like, oh, my God, amazing tuna steak. And then they go back from, <laughs> and then they go diving and they get back and they're like, oh, we didn't see anything in the water. And you're like, uh, yeah, it was just on your plate. Yeah. So there's obviously a very strong correlation yeah. um, between what you see in the water and uh, what you have on your plate. So... I think, you know, Tubataha is a marine park. It's protected. You do get all your gray reefs, black tips, white tips. Uh, uh, normally, we do get quite a few whale sharks there. Um, this season, less than prior seasons. And um, we saw what well, we did see, two hammerheads, which I've never seen there. Um, so there are hammerheads there. Uh, mantas, all sorts of ray, marble rays, eagles, you know, all sorts of... Uh, yeah big uh animals and then tunas massive really? freaking huge tunas barracudas jackfish just schools parrot bumphead parrotfish the big one you know like mm. just all sorts of big all sorts of mm. big stuff yeah hey i wanted to um i wanted to ask about and then the, you've got those people looking for nudie banks <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think you'd save that for, you know, back up Sorry, back up a... north, you know, Tibetaho, it's gotta be wide angle for sure. Um yeah. I was gonna ask about oh I am gonna ask about um what's it called? Oslob and the whale sharks. Um mm -hmm. now I went there years and years and years ago, um, when I didn't know any better. Um and I've gotta say it was surprising and quite alarming at the quantity of people getting in the water to swim with whale sharks um obviously it's good for the locals because they're turning some good coin um but one thing that's always stuck in mind is the whale sharks are they getting used to hulls and are they getting damaged by other boats when they leave that kind of area and um i'd be intrigued to know what your kind of opinion on oslob and the way the whale sharks have been um, used, I suppose. Treated, I think. Um, let me ask you with a different, Treated, let me start with yeah. a different question. Yeah. Um, also for the people listening, do you go to zoos? No, but yeah. Neither do I. I. Yeah. Neither do I. So that's kind of like a diff very different breed of people because 90% of people would go to zoos. Mm. I think divers wouldn't go to uh, sea world and aquariums <laughs> although i will tell you i was insanely surprised to hear how many people go and dive with the whale sharks in the georgia aquarium mm. where a 20 minute dive is 425 us dollars yeah. and dive shops arrange trips there yeah so to me to me that is you know it's it's <laughs> oslo is an open ocean yeah. uh, the feeding is done three hours a day so nobody's forcing the whale sharks to be there. That's to begin with, right? Um, I think studies are still being done um, and now also partly funded by the uh, government there, the local government uh, was uh, alarmed and required to uh, devote some of the humongous income uh, to sharks, uh, to whale shark research. So there's always like, you'll see, especially now, like the last couple of times that I went since after the pandemic, um, you do get more, you will see marine biologists in the water kind of like observing and, and swimming with you, with people and just looking at the behavior of the sharks and stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, Matt. Mm. That's a complicated question. I mean, this is goes back to my, hey, how was your tuna steak, right? Mm. We mm. are people and we have desires and people just go, hey, where's my bucket list? You know, <laughs> it's no different than uh, poking, poking a, a blue ring octopus. So the blue rings come out, mm. and you can get a nice photo. Yeah, it's no different. I mean, I, it's I, I, no I, different. I, I, it's just that one is smaller. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm not trying to put dispersions on anyone who goes there now, because you know, I was one of those people. I knew no different, and I just wanted to see the whale sharks. Um, but um, but plus, it's well managed, Matt. It's yes. really well managed. Like it's one of the only places in the world where you go, and there are actually dozens of people in the water from from 
from the operation. Mm. If you go too close, they will tell you to go far. If you shoot with a flash, they'll tell you to stop. Uh, if you try to touch a whale shark, would you be surprised how many people do try to? There's actually a prison. Uh, it's actually in the law in the Philippines. You're not allowed to touch them. Oh, good. Um, and you can get a fine, and you can go to prison up to four years. Mm. Uh, it's in the law. It's okay. actually a pretty big animal, uh, the the uh, buntag, as they're called in uh, local uh, language um, mm. in Tagalog. Uh, they're on the 100 pesos bill as well. Mm. So they're, they're quite part of that, that theme. Popular. Um, I've got a, I've also, I've also got to put a caveat on it that um, I actually was at an aquarium two days ago um, because we took some disabled divers diving with well uh, with uh, not with well sharks but with nurse sharks. And and you know and that kind of goes to like, where do you draw the line? You know, some people say, oh, well, I'll draw the line. You know, aquariums are actually saving. Um, they're actually saving, I don't know, endangered species. And it's important that for the education side of it. It's important when we take kids there so they can get connected with the water. You know, I took my son to swim with the whale sharks in Oslo mm. probably about 10 times, mm. you know, since he was two and a half, like put his head in the water and he's like, oh my God, it's going to eat me. I'm like, that's not going to eat you. Oh, it's going to eat me. Because it's a like, big mouth. Like, you know, it's hard. It's hard where to draw the line. You do also have to remember that we, and especially people listening to this podcast, we're divers. We know the ocean and we love it. Mm then 90% of the people going to Oslo are locals or Chinese yeah. or, and Koreans, you know, people who would not necessarily ever be in the water in that scenario, who probably have very likely seen more dead fish than any fish alive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Dead fish in their plates and in their food. So there is that aspect as well. I, I don't know where to draw the line. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a, it's a very fine line. I think we each uh, define it to ourselves and um i think relatively speaking to to compare to you know aquariums and zoos and a distressed environment in that sense uh yeah it's you know it's 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 definitely better because the whale sharks are migrating through they're free they don't get enough food to stick around yeah forever like to be to be kind of like a your pet your pet whale shark <laughs> that would be a lot of food around. to sustain an adult whale that would shark, be a lot of food yeah. yeah um and you know there are no motor boats in the area uh there's only the bunker boats with the you know with the the rows so mm. don't know it's a tough one i mm. mean mm. And, lots um, of people do it and the people who don't want to do it don't do it yeah yeah so is there any other hot spots for uh sand whale sharks for divers absolutely the coast, the oh my god you can't dive with them can you oh uh, you can oh, you it? can we dive with them off the liverboard yeah we dive okay. with them off the liverboard uh not offshore uh just because uh the local operations there are not uh par with our safety requirements so mm. we don't do that we used to be able to do that off our bunkers when we do the cross islands but we can't cross island with bunkers anymore since 2019 uh, rules change with how far bunkers can go so okay. uh yeah so we can't do that we used to do that with bunkers or with a liverboard i think um there are definitely uh, definitely definitely other spots uh tubataha is one and then you've got southern leyte so if you look at southern leyte on the map southern leyte l-e-y-t-e -E, uh that's also part of the visayas region but it's the furthest east and that's basically where the Pacific Ocean is. So okay. that's where they would funnel through coming in, right? Well, and then a, there's Donso. A, a nice deep, deep channel out there as well, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. And actually, that is also snorkeling. They're very well protected there, and you can't dive with them. It's snorkeling, basically. Uh, we did a trip there uh, on our liverboard last December, which we're looking to do again in 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will be led uh, by Dr. Gonzalo Araujo, who's a... Uh, shark researcher and a phd in marine biology spent seven years in the philippines um studying mi migration of sharks so he's leading a trip which is very educational and we do we do malapasqua and southern Leyte to go see them in a bit more of a natural environment mm. um and then there is donso yeah which is also a place where people uh do see them and that, that but that's seasonal right yeah. So I think what people, and also Southern Leyte is seasonal. The most sightings are in December and January. So it, it's a, you know, look at us today. I mean, I'm just looking at you. I've got my screen and I've got about 27 other Chrome windows open. Like we <laughs> want everything now and everything instant. And, you know, I was just on a week in Tubataha. We had freaking incredible dives and literally people would come up from the dives. And I understand that saying, 
Let's let's do the whale shark dance. We want to see whale sharks. I mean, there's so many other amazing things mm. um, in the water. But, you know, I do get the fascination. So I think people want something that's sure, that's guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. And that's why Oslo is so popular. Yeah, yeah. And Well, I mean, to be fair, I think people that know about Tuba Taha and book on a couple of years in advance, so, you know, they, they, they realize that nothing's a guarantee. Um, no matter how many oh, yeah, whale shark definitely. dances you do and manta waves. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, on the other hand, I will say that the, the route that we do off our liveaboard that includes uh, Malapascua, yeah. I think does not fall short, does not fall short because we move every day. We start in our Dawan location uh, in Atlantis Dumaguete and then we do we do Oslo bin Sumilon. So you do get the whale sharks diving. Yeah. So no masses there. And then we do um, kind of altars right now we don't do mold ball and pescador but we do go up to malapasqua and we do gato island which is incredible caverns with white tip sharks sleeping and like really really cool topography we do kalangaman which is a really nice wall obviously we get the threshers in the morning um and then we kind of go off on the east side and then we do kabilao bali kasag which is a beautiful 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 dive site in the philippines another um marine sanctuary with you, like school of jacks and really great corals lots of turtles lots of banded sea snakes very similar to upper island um and then we do Panglao and we do, we can do anda and so there's a lot of other points in the visayas region hmm. that people can go to uh that are not in the middle of the sea with the deep walls but have the same amazing biodiversity as tubatan hmm. hmm. what's a, a t- to be honest, Ronnie, listening to all this, my mind's fucking blown. That's uh, <laughs> all these locations, <laughs> all these locations that you're listing off are all locations that I've looked at in the past thinking, oh, yeah, one day I'm going to get there. Um, mm. the, the the time from Dumagate up to Malaqua, Malapasco, is that, do you do that in one kind of hit or do you oh, do no, 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 stops no, no, along no. the way? No, no, we do it. We do stops along the way. We yeah. do stops along the way. So the the idea of doing a Visayas route for anyone really is to be able to hit multiple destination dive destinations mm-hmm. uh, that otherwise would take you over a month. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> the idea is to be able to hit all those all those points in you know seven to ten days, mm. and that's really really unique. Um, it's kind of like your Raja Ampat area, you know, but it's just, it's so, it's so diverse. The topography is so different. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the biodiversity is, is so vast mm. that really those are, and to me, we also do another route, but we do that on alternating years. Um, and that's Upper Reef and Coron Rex. You know, I don't know if you know, but in Buswanga, which is in Coron Island, we have dugongs. Yes. Um, and those are territorial and are very shy i've been to many places where you you would hear of one or you'd see them from the helicopter but not in the philippines yeah. and i went diving with them and it's very very regulated uh there's uh it's seven meters uh depth between five and seven you're allowed 20 minutes in the water with them only four divers somebody watching you on top that you don't get too close and they just literally you have to swim away because they're in your face <laughs> that's incredible in incredible experience so you know we do that route we leave from Porta galera and then we do upper reef which is the second largest marine uh park in the philippines mm-hmm. uh lots of sharks so it's three islands with the channels uh sandy channels in between them about 30 meters mm-hmm. and then we get the um you know we get a lot of gray reefs white tips black tips uh, rays etc again it's it's you can't get there on day boats so you know that eliminates all sorts of fishing yeah and uh yeah then we do the rex and corone and then we do barracuda lake which i think is one <laughs> of the freakiest dive one would do uh in their lives i mean it's, it's like diving the cenotes right like do you remember the first time you dove the cenotes did yeah. you di- have you did you dive the cenotes yeah, in yeah, Mexico? Yeah, yeah. yeah do you remember the first time you go in there like through the freaking jungle yeah. and then you sit down you go into these like really cold water and you you, you go in and then all these games of like lights and and cliffy topography right and the visibility is like air and then you get a goldfish swimming you're like ooh, <laughs> it's just so exciting it's so different right there, there, and that's not, barracuda lake because it's a landlock right? there's not bar- there's not barracuda in this lake is there there is there is there get is one there is one i mean at least when i was there, yeah he's like fucking 
four times the size of me. No, probably twice the size of me. Huge barracuda because there's no predators, right? Yeah, yeah. Because he is literally, massive. that's literally landlocked, isn't it? It's landlocked and it's freshwater. Yeah. And the uh, interesting thing about it, so freshwater is obviously 100% visibility, mm. but the interesting thing about it is that it's reverse thermocline. So it, uh, at the surface, you're at like 26 Celsius, you start going down, it starts getting warmer. Oh. And and it's really freaky. So yeah, so you're not diving with weight, and you're not diving with a wetsuit because you know it's warm. So you do, mm. you know. I, I did put a rash guard because I I was like, ooh, this, you know, I'm not used to diving in my my bathing suit, and I'm really <laughs> happy that I didn't. I'll tell you why in a minute. But like, you start going down, and then at like ten meters, it's it's about thirty Celsius, and then fifteen meters, like thirty five, and then twenty meters, you're at forty Celsius. You're like. You know, it's kind of like the the breathing is a bit weird. It's, yeah. So you kind of spend most of your time at like 10, 15 meters where you're, you know, comfortably warm but not boiling. And then you see the thermal clients, like these clouds of, of oil all over. And then it's yeah. cliffs, right? It's all these vertical volcanic cliffs. And it's just topography is insane. It's insane. It's like diving in space. I would imagine. I, I don't know. I didn't have <laughs> space yet, but you know, that I would imagine that's how you would look like. Yeah. So yeah, it's very, very, very freaky. And then you do your safety stop, and you got these um, these goatfish and these cleaning shrimps that obviously have no predators. So yeah. they're like, Ooh, start climbing all over you, pulling your hair, and it's just <laughs> yeah, it's just a very different, very different kind of diving, which I, I really like. Yeah, and the wrecks are pretty cool. There's a lot of stuff on them in Koron, mm. um, and then we do the dugongs, and we do the two wrecks of the Swanga, um, which have, you know, you could really see, it's kind of like, a bit like Palau and uh, truck, where you could see the silhouette of the boat as you go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of depths are they at? Uh, so they're about 20 boats, or well, ships, their average length, 120 meters. Okay. Uh, so it's the entire Japanese fleet that went there to run. Uh, from the Americans and uh, most boats sink in the channel and that's why we don't have the greatest visibility it's like 10-15 meters hmm. um, but they're under 40 meters so 10-15 so meters of visibility would be fantastic in Sydney that'd be a good day yeah like I said I mean you guys you guys are, are very uh, particular and strange it's like the it's like the <laughs> it's like the west coast divers of the United States you know they'd be like in January yay we're going in the water <laughs> okay <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. You do, you get the orcas, you get the seals, you get all these crazy rays. But I, yeah, I'd be a popsicle. Yeah. I mean, I'm a wuss tropical diver. Mate, I yeah. did. We went diving on Sunday, and we did a double boat dive, and um, the weather had come in a little bit. We didn't no rain, but it was just cold, cold, biting wind. So yesterday, Oof. I was like Oof. death. Oof. I just couldn't get couldn't get warm. Snotty. It was horrible. So I think I need to yeah, don a dry I suit again you. or get a heated vest or something like that for the winter times. I, yeah, I think I would totally do that. I'm, you know, I'm getting to a point now where I'm, you know, less scared of very cold water. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'm going to do, I'm going to start doing some dry suit stuff, uh, especially, you know, kind of like when you go to Oz or um, West Coast of the United States, you know, places where it would, it would make sense to go diving, but I, I could never do it without a dress. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I dive five mil, five mil and a hood in the Philippines. No, I would be board so, short. Well, tech like shorts said, and a rashi. That's about it. Yeah. Tropical wuss. Soon, soon. Hey, um, it. speaking of soon, <laughs> soon. The When we first started talking, you were planning just a, a familiar visit. That kind of thing. Has that been filled up yet? Are you coming? Maybe. Yay! Has, has it been filled and up? Then I can show you Verde <laughs> Island. I can show you Verde Island. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we do, you know, we do familiar trips for dive shop owners and mm. group leaders. Um, obviously, Atlantis is a little bit different than um, some of the other operations where I would say on average, probably 60, 60, 65% of our business is, is groups. Yeah. That's predominantly what we do uh, on the boat. It's, you know, 90% of the boat is full boat charters. Mm. So that's a group, coherent mm. group. Uh, but we really know how to run that. We really, really know how to run that. So, uh, you know, you get your, you, we, you deviate the divers into groups of six because our, that's our maximum ratio is one dive guide, six divers. Mm. Um, normally they would have their own speed boat or there'd be two, boat, two, two 
uh, different groups on one bunker boat uh, if we take the bunkers. So the idea is really to create an exquisite and very personal diving experience. But, yeah. you know, kind of going through that routine of getting a group of anywhere from 10 to 50, 60. Our largest group was 120 people. Yeah. You know, it's it's we know how to handle those kind of groups. We know how to stagger the day, how to how to get all the boats running and and people out and back on time. We have dedicated camera rooms in both resorts, so people spend their surface interval. I didn't mention that. So we do five dives a day, mm. where everybody goes like, "Oh my God, this is so much! I'm never going to do five. <laughs> but you know, the setup is so different because we come back to the resort after each dive. And so you've got your coffee, you've got your tea, you've got your cookies, you're in the camera room, and then, okay, it's time to go diving again. So it's not this like long boat rides where you have to surface into like you mentioned on the boat, getting cold, wanting to dry, and, uh, and then you gotta go to the second dive, you're like, oh my God, uh, I'm not even sure I wanna get in the water. But yeah, there's none of that because you're back in the resort, yeah. right? And you dry off and then, and so, it's kind of like a liveaboard. It's like boom, 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 boom. You don't want to dive on, fine, you miss it out. Like you, you don't have to decide in the morning. You just sit out one dive, you go rest, then you join the next one because they're scheduled. Yeah, right? yeah. So it makes it pretty easy uh, with the surface interval of the resorts. Yeah, I've got 10 questions that I've been asking every guest this season. Um, so why don't we fire into some of those and see how you get on. 10 commandments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hailing down from the sky. Go. <laughs> yeah. no. Okay. Um, how do you describe your job as a diver to people who are not familiar with the activity? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really funny one. So my my. Um, <laughs> it's a very that's a yeah. Uh, literally, so so a lot of times you'd be like. Um, especially because now you know we, we during the pandemic we got stuck in israel yeah. um uh, uh involuntarily and uh we, we made dues we're, we're fine and then people would ask um so so what do you do and i go oh i um i work for scuba diving resorts and you know israel being israel people do dive um yeah. quite a lot and they at least know what it is generally uh but then some people go scuba diving and you're like yeah you know that thing with the tanks and you're like Oh, you mean like going underwater? Like, yeah. You're like, oh my God, I would never do that. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's about 80% of the responses that I get. Um, <laughs> people go, oh, I'm so scared of it, you know, or I'm, I'm freaked out by it. But the funniest story is like when I listen to, um, so my son is in second grade, he's seven and a half. And uh, where people ask him, what does his mom do? And he goes, uh, my mom's job is to tell people how beautiful scuba diving is, and especially in the Philippines, and where they can see a lot of fish and also whale sharks. Because I've been swimming with whale sharks. <laughs> and that's my job described by a seven and a half year old. Um, so yeah, that's how I would describe it. You know, the it's it's not it's not you can you can do the corporate thing oh you know i do sales and marketing for atlantis dive resorts because there's a chain of scuba diving resort and a liveaboard and we tell people why they should dive with us over all the other people mm. uh no that's not my job yeah totally not my job uh my job is to share with people how amazing the philippines is uh and there is a lot of places in the philippines that are amazing yeah uh not just where we are but a lot of places in the world that are amazing for diving but particularly in the philippines mm. um and then my job is to explain to people what that the difference between 90 and 100 is 100%. And that's where we excel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our retention rate is 45%. So 45% of our guests come back. Uh, that speaks that's a lot. High. I always joke and tell people. It's huge. And massive. I always joke and I tell people, I always joke and tell people, look, mm -hmm. you know, my job is to get people to come for the first time. Mm. It could be very, very hard because we're not just competing over uh, with other operations in the Philippines, right? Or other destinations. We're competing with everyone. Yeah. So let's say you've got a week off or two weeks off and two weeks and two grand, right? So you'll say, hey, where can I do, where can I go? What can I do, right? Philippines could be one option, mm. but there are obviously many, many, many other locations that people want to go to. So, you know, first of all, you're competing with the world. Um, and this is just in the world of scuba diving. Then mm. you've got your competing vacation where you've got a, a scuba diver who now married, oh God for sake, a non-diver. <laughs> I don't know how people do that. Um, um, you know, when I met my partner, he wasn't a diver and I was like, yeah, mate i think you yeah and he's a dive master now so it's just like <laughs> you gotta level the plane mate um and so 
I think, you know, and then you got these guys who are like wondering between, you know, what do we do on school holidays and stuff like that? Should we go a place where that involves scuba diving? What do we do? You know, there's, there's that. And then within the scuba diving world, there's other destinations. Within the Philippines, there's other destinations. And in our destinations, there are other operators. So, um, you know, I think my job is to help people narrow that search down mm. uh, to find uh, something that they will get an amazing experience. I really do believe in it. Yeah. I really do believe that uh, in our world, it's we create experiences for people. Yeah. And that experience, like we just talked about, right? Like you do a double tank dive and you have 12 hours and you're underwater for two. Yeah. So with Atlantis, you're underwater for five hours a day, but it's, it is 12 hour days, yeah. right? It's 13 sometimes, depending on how, how much you sleep. <laughs> so it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of creating everything that's around it as well. Yeah. No, so great, great answer, job. great answer. Uh, okay, how about ah? Uh, can you share a memorable diving experience that stands out to you as the best you've ever had? Uh, I've got one that stands out. I don't know if I could say it's <laughs> go for it. The best. I, I don't believe in the best, you know, there's so many dives I haven't dove yet and so many dives that I dove that I just came out and said, oh my God, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Um, no, but I, I had a, so it's, it's kind of like a, it's a personal story as well, but like we, we were in Palau and we uh, decided that we should, um, you know, make some offsprings and make sure that there's more future divers in the world mm -hmm. uh, so the industry doesn't die. And um, we, <laughs> you know, we obviously you don't know and you're a remote island and, uh, you know, the, of course, you've got pregnancy tests and stuff, but it's not that very, I mean, you're not so entwined into it. You kind of live your life and, you know, off you go. So uh, we had already decided uh, to, to leave and to go to Costa Rica. Like we, we took a job in Costa Rica and, yeah. um, my partner went a month ahead of me uh, to start because the, that, the restaurant and the resort we ran, the resort was kind of small. It's like really five upscale villas, but the restaurant was massive. Mm. So it had uh, 95 seats and, um, you know, he's a, he's a chef. Well, not anymore, but was at the time. Uh, so he went ahead of me and then I, uh, you know, and I, I, I didn't know yet, you know, what was going on. I didn't really feel I was in a mass of like packing and, you know, handing down and, uh, you know, all the, all my job for the, my, uh, successor and et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one day I was like, Oh my God, I haven't been diving in like a couple of weeks. So I better jump on a boat, jumped in a boat, went to German channel. Um, and normally I would stick at the end, kind of like the end of the group, like at least make eye contact and stuff, but kind of stick to myself. Cause you're not guiding anymore and you're not part of the, you know, so I'd be kind of like at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was this female gray reef who was just gliding next to me in a really, really you know, normally they'd be next to you and then off they swim because they, you know, they don't like the noise that comes out of our gear and yeah. everything. Um, but she, she kept gliding, gliding and gliding and gliding and gliding. And so half an hour goes by and we're like literally on the edges of the wall, you know, towards the mouth of the channel or past the mouth of the channel. I think people were looking at mantas. I don't know. It was just like literally <laughs> her and I, yeah. And at some point, I'm kind of like, it was, it was really, really strange. It was really strange. A lot of sharks in Palau, they do come really close, but they don't stick with you for that long. Yeah. And then at some point, I'm just kind of looking at her and going, oh my God, I'm pregnant. <laughs> got back to, uh, yeah, man, got back to the water, got back to, uh, just got back with that crazy realization in my head. Went back up, you know, washed my gear, blah, blah, finished my work day, went to the pharmacy got a test and there you go Lo and behold holy smokes yeah so i think you know the i think the scientific explanation would probably be they, they do feel pulses yeah right okay so i think she must have kind of felt two different pulses yeah. in, in one thing so i think maybe that was but she just I, I don't know i don't know what it was but that is a very 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 memorable uh dive for me still that's, to that's this awesome. day yeah Awesome. Yeah, very, very crazy. Yeah. Okay. If someone wanted to pursue a career similar to yours, what advice would you give them? <laughs> love it. You got to love it. 
you definitely don't do this for the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, just love it. Love it. And I think any career, not just mine, just yeah. follow your passion. Totally. Go with the current. Don't fight it. Don't, don't, don't think about what you do today to do it tomorrow. Look, I came from that world. Like I was that recreational diver in this high rolling corporate job with suits and not wetsuits, but real suits. Mm. Um, and all this, all, all this jazz with where you make a lot of money so you can spend a lot of money when you go do the things you love. So I make uh, half the money now, but I am super happy and I do what I love every day. Yeah. And I think that's irreplaceable for me. You know, people are different. Whatever makes you tick, whatever makes yeah. you tick. Yeah, but it's, you're uh, right. It's, that, that, you it's that work-life balance thing that you've got to get going on, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if it's work-life balance. I think this kind of work is your life. <laughs> and that's the difference. People well, is, talk about work-life balance. <laughs> no, this is your life. Well, and I think for a lot of people in this industry, right? So I think yeah. that's what makes it so special. Yeah. Is, is people I, it, who are I really think it's passionate a very, about um, what they're doing. There's like a murky water between, because like, like you say, suits, corporate world, nine to five, nine to six, whatever it is, you kind of know mm. your clock. How, but this industry because it's not only a job it's a passion that nine to six might be nine to one one day if there's nothing going on but it could be nine till midnight if you're having a great time with guests and you know talking passionately about well topics like we're talking about now yeah mm. absolutely and it doesn't feel like work no, you know and true. that's what i that's what i really believe in yeah. doesn't yeah. happy days Okay, if you could change anything about the diving industry or scuba diving in general, oh, what would it be? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's a big one. Um, I wish divers stopped eating fish. <laughs> that's, that'd, be a, that'd be a first one. Um, no, I think, I, think, I think what this industry needs but has, has, and it's starting, and I really see it, I really, really see it, is the connection that we have to the ocean beyond the scuba diving. Mm -hmm. I think we, because we are there, and like you said, you know, most people don't, don't do it. I mean, realistically, most people in the world don't scuba dive percentage-wise, right? We're a very small percentage of the population. Yeah. I think it's our job, we're ambassadors. Mm -hmm. We're ambassadors. And it's our job to tell people um, even small things, you know, just the to, to, to smallest pieces of information that people don't think about because they don't dive. Um, for example, the whole discussion with microplastics and why it's so important to recycle, right? So there is, and I'll give you an example. There's, there's a, an NGO of six local women in Dumaguete. They make jewelry from recycled materials, okay? Um, it's 100% proceeds go to them. Really cool. It's called Lumago. Google them. Support them. L-U-M-A-G-O. Say it again. Um, sorry, L U M A G O, right? Okay. Uh, and they they make these jewelry from uh, from anything recycled. They started with paper and then they went on to leather and cotton and stuff. And so recently, recently being the last kind of like five years, uh, we we support them. So we we get um, some of our giveaways from them. Okay. Everything's handmade and one hundred percent proceeds go to them. And six families are being fed mm. uh, by those efforts, right? But with the lady that we worked with, Flor, she's really awesome. And then so they started doing this, um, these jewelry from, from recycled plastic. So they got this m machine that cuts plastic in different shapes. Mm -hmm. And they make these amazing, amazing um, jewelry. It's like a hoop. And then it's got these um, pieces of plastic hanging, but they're all cut in a certain shape. And you've got the blue ones. Those are the Suave bottles, you know, the fabric detergent. No, oh, yeah. the fabric, um, the laundry softener, softener, softener. fabric, whatever yeah. softener thing. Yeah, softener thing. And then you've got your um, orange ones are from Tide and the laundry detergent. And then you've got the, the different ones from, you know, your your uh, dish soap, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And we talked about it and, I, and we talked about when to start doing them. And I, I always buy them. I buy them also personally. And then those my girlfriends know that's what they're getting for their birthdays, <laughs> collecting <laughs> their Lumago collection every birthday. Um, and so, you know, I told Flora and I said, well, that's really great. And then. We talked about where you get the plastic, and then they said, oh, you know, Mama, and we just go out on the beach and collect it. But there's so much plastic on the beach. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, because they, obviously they go in the city of Dumaguete. And I said, yeah. or in Sibulan, which is by the airport. Um, and I said, yeah, there is. 
And so didn't you see that before? And she's like, actually, we almost didn't notice it before. Yeah. But now we do. So, you know, it's those little things. And it, there is a saying um, in the Old Testament that says, if you've changed one soul, it is if you've changed the whole world. And I really do believe in it. Yeah, we're just one person, one little person. Oh, my God, what difference can I make? Huge one. Yeah. Huge one. If we all think that we can make a difference, there'll be no difference made. So just do do your little part. You know, educate others. I think this industry uh, needs to have more people that are ambassadors for the ocean. Mm. You already dive because you love it. You know, talk to your friends about it. Explain to them the importance of recycling. Explain to them the, the effect of microplastic in the, in the ocean, right? The runoff. Mm. Using biodegradable materials. Avoiding single-use plastic man i'm having this discussion with people here in a first world country yeah you know why single use do you think why do you think the philippines are now starting to catch up with the western world on the awareness of single use plastics because i know the finger's been pointed Um, at the likes of the philippines have been heavy plastic users and dumpers but we are. Uh, I mean, we are at the resorts. There's no single-use plastic. Even our straws are bamboo. So mm-hmm. we try to do everything kind of locally. All of our bi- all of our toiletries are biodegradable mm. because we're on the boat, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. in the resorts close to the ocean. Yeah. Um, I think on a on, from a population perspective, light years away. Yeah. It's just also different economical traits. Look, my master's is in in business, focusing on international economics, and you look at obviously totally related to what I do now, right? Mm. Uh, you look at consumption graphs um, around the world and, you know, people in third world countries normally get paid every two weeks, right? Um, and then you see the consumption graphs go up, whew, right? Because that's when they spend all their money. So savings is pretty flat. Yeah. It's changing, obviously, now with the growing middle class, uh, which is in the Philippines. But predominantly, most of the people, they go to the local stores and the, your shampoo, your laundry detergent, your everything comes in those aluminium single-use lines. Yeah. Right? So it's that concept of getting away from that packaging. Mm. Everything is wrapped in another thing and another thing and another thing. So, yeah, they're not huge dumpers, to be honest, because a lot of people burn their trash. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, you know, like I said, one at a time. Yeah. One person at a time. We will make a difference. Yeah. We will. Yeah, one second. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, the I'm next question—the the next question was going to be, "What are your thoughts on ways to minimize human impacts of the oceans?" I think we just nailed that. that. One. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, has your passion for diving, or indeed the industry, changed over time? And if so, how? Um, I think I think you know we all do have a moment uh, with where we question ourselves. I think my biggest challenge um, and the greatest thing, the, the best thing I did was to stop guiding. Honestly, to stop I became guiding. this really angry guide. Stop oh. guiding. Yes, I became okay. a very angry guide because people were was just at the time. This was like the two thousand twelve ish. Everybody started getting cameras, you know, it became so accessible, it became affordable and everybody, even the shitty divers Mm. started diving with cameras. And of course, what do they want to do is take great pictures. Why would you want to take great pictures? There's so many amazing photographers out there. Just go, here you go. This is what I saw and take a picture from the internet, whatever. Right? No, but people want to take their own pictures and their own movies and their own, their own, their own. And in, and in doing that, they, not deliberately, most people, not deliberately, some deliberately, which is ridiculous, uh, you know, break, break, break stuff and touch things. And, 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 and that I, I kind of became really, really angry, angry, angry guide, angry guide. Didn't want to show anyone anything Yeah. because I was worried they're going to, they're going to move stuff and they're going to touch things. They're going to break things. And it was just, I was seeing fins everywhere being, you know, kicking corals. And I was just like, ah, so yeah, I, I, that was a, that was a really good time to, to stop guiding. Yeah. Um, uh, with, with that in mind. And, uh, I think, you know, that was, that was a turning point for me also to re-understand and and re-examine your passion to it. Mm. If you, I got, you know, when I was guiding in the Philippines, uh, 13 years ago, I got hypothermia. I was in the hospital for four days. So I, you know, it's, it gets, 
I know. I know. It was raining. It was 25 Celsius, four <laughs> dives a day. I told you. The worst tropical diver. But it was very, very difficult. Well, you get to a point where it's raining and you just look and you go, I don't want to be in the water now. Mm. And come on, every single dive professional had that or still has that from time to time. That's normal. You know, that's just how you feel about your job. But I, I, I kind of, I was really happy you making that change and really being able to dive when I want and just go, oh my God, I miss it so much. I have to go to the water, <laughs> you know? So, and that would be a week without diving. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair one. So, yeah, I mean, you gotta, you gotta find, you gotta find where your passion is. Some people just love guiding and love teaching. And, oh my God, I look at some instructors that I know who are in their fifties and they're still so eager to show it to people and, and overcome difficulties that divers have when they first get in the water. And, you know, I think that's amazing. I think yeah. we each have our calling and we need to find that. Okay. Here's a good one for you. <clears throat> of the many oh. safety procedures we have in the industry, if you had to choose one as the most important, what would it be? Um, I can only speak from like personal incidents, right? Because yeah. <laughs> that's that's what runs in my head right now. Uh, two things, two things. Um, do stay close to your body. Mm -hmm. Stay close to your body. And have freaking oxygen on the boat. Have oxygen on the boat. Make sure you dive with somebody that has oxygen on the boat. Make sure that the tanks are serviced. You know, make sure that if does something happen, people know what to do. You know, I, I had... And this happens. This is just statistics, you know, mm. with, with over 2,500 dives, you know, you're bound to have stuff happening to you. And so once I had my O-ring exploding at 20 meters, mm -hmm. okay, and at that point, you, you know, you, you, could, you could freak out and go up and then one would hope that there'd be oxygen on the boat and that's the rest of your diving holiday is probably pooped. Mm. Um, if, unless you get, you know, at least you wait for a few days to see what happened. Uh, but yeah, I was close with my, my buddy and we shared air and it was fine and we went up, but the, the dive operation, actually it was, it was at Atlantis and I was mm -hmm. diving as a fun diver, right? Not guiding or anything or not even leading a group, none of that stuff. It's just fun diving. But you were um, working for I them was by close then? with my buddy. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, you know, the, the, the dive guides were just amazing. There were, we, we have two dive guides. There were two dive guides. There was a safety diver, uh, which was one of the dive guides and within an instant of a second, I had someone with me, you know, holding us two together, making sure, you know, making sure that we were fine, surfacing with us. And it was just, everything was super smooth. Mm. And things like that happen. Mm. Things like that happen. It's not, it, it's just statistics. It's like, if you drive a car, you will bump into someone else's car at some point, or somebody will bump into you. It's just statistics. So I think uh, diving in an operation that has all those safety trainings and mechanisms in place is super, super important. I dove um, in the Dominican Republic with uh, someone who was guiding the dive and was just going up and down and up and down and up and down. And I was like, and I was a recreational diver at the time. And I was like, I'm not following that profile. That's fucking bullshit. Yeah. That's, that's putting me at risk in a remote location off a falling apart boat well it was also me because i wanted to go dive there but um <laughs> you know there was definitely no oxygen on the boat there was definitely no oxygen on land the nearest hospital was like i don't even know how far hmm. that was more of an kind of like an expedition thing that i was like oh let's go do this but you know i i i think i think staying safe in general being close with your buddy making sure that you're on especially if you're diving as a recreational diver uh make sure that there's oxygen on the boat yeah yeah and don't be afraid to ask the question yeah. ask ask oh, to make God, sure no. that the shit's in place you know absolutely absolutely you know how i dive now when i go diving like for on my vacation oh my god i check everything do you check do you walk I on the boat everything. walk on the boat with a checklist uh no but i look around <laughs> i look around and they will say and they will say you know like when i was in egypt now they were like oh yeah we have oxygen on the boat and I'm like oh okay awesome when did you last check it because you know when i did my dive master in honduras and we would show up super hungover mm. um you would take a hit of the oxygen yeah. you take a hit of the oxygen of course you do everybody does it don't lie you've done it if you're a dive professional 
you know, everybody. And then, and then, and then when there is an emergency, nobody knows that that bottle is not full. Yeah. So I'm just saying like those little things, they make a very big difference in one's life. So, yeah. 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 I don't know if I answered your question. I think so. We've got that one. It is, it is okay. one of the most difficult questions you're ever going to answer in your life. What are your top yeah. five bucket list destinations? Ah, places I haven't been to. No, no. It can be where you've been or where you want to be. <laughs> bucket list. <sighs> um, no, they're all places I haven't been to. That's that's my bucket list because I because and that changes all the time, right? It changes all the time mm. as you as you as you progress and you go along. So right now, my next my my um. Well, look, I I from places I have been, I'll answer that in two folds. From places I have been, um, uh, obviously, definitely, 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 I've got a couple. There's one. Um, there's Palau. Yep. Of course. Um, Peleliu, to be particular, really, really, really nice dive sites, uh, and Oolong Channel, it's definitely one of my favorite. Uh, Black Rock in Tubataha. Okay. Uh, Gato Island in, off Malapascua, with that cavern that you swim through, and it's like then you see the light out. Uh, Cenotes in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, and that dive with the dugongs, man, that was like. <laughs> mind blowing that there's a truck coming your way yeah. uh yeah from places i haven't been um cocos mm -hmm. cocos 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 um sea of cortez in mexico uh as you can see colder 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 places i need to get a dry suit um <laughs> right. or um uh, or eat a lot more and get some thermal insulation Mm hmm exactly i just got a brand new waterproof w7 wetsuit oh nice oh, so good oh i, li so I literally just missed out missed out on one of those this weekend I, I, I got back in touch with a guy and it literally sold like 25 minutes before oh my what a wetsuit i've owned a yeah. bunch of wetsuits in my life that's probably the best i've ever owned Agreed. Yeah, I was not called for an instant of a second. <laughs> um, yeah, so Sea of Cortez, uh, Maldives, which surprisingly I haven't been to, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, strange. Yeah, and all of your 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 region there, your you know PNG. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I hear a lot of good things in PNG. So yeah, places these kind of places I haven't been to yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's particular locations around the world that are just game changers. You know, Philippines, Indonesia, Galapagos. PNG's right up there for me. Yeah. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. And I and I think that that kind of to me, if you dive a place extensively for a few years and you still love it, mm -hmm. that's a bucket list. Yeah. So, you know, for me that's definitely uh definitely Palau in the Philippines. Yeah. These two. Yeah, cool. All right, last one for you. Um, how would you describe the dive community to a non-diver? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a bunch of tattooed individuals wearing jeans and sneakers and trade shows. Uh, drink like fish. Love uh -huh. fish. <laughs> and um, there's just any resemblance between... Uh, 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 a professional industry you know what we think of like a corporate industry you know kind of like a and this world is is none to be found yeah. i think everybody and i and i have this discussion with you'd be surprised a lot of people um everybody in this industry loves it yeah yeah there's not a single person in it that goes oh my god ugh, diving ugh, uh, no you can't yeah. it's just and i think that makes a huge difference everybody is very laid back mm -hmm. very very laid back for better or worse right uh sometimes i wish to be a bit more of a business etique um <laughs> just in a way businesses are are not being run but how businesses interact with each other on the b2b world which is more my world yeah. um uh, I th I you think know like a, for example a... especially 
there's, there's huge opportunities there. I think everybody's keen to do B2B, but I think you hit the nail on the head early on when we first started this chat that, that there's just not a lot of knowledge of how to do it without offending people. Yeah, I think it's, it's yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Look, I mean, your typical, your typical dive operation, small dive resorts, especially in Southeast Asia, is, is either a retired couple that uh, take their pension and build a small facility and they love diving and now they're making it a kind of like a second living in a way or just a retirement plan. Or you've got your dive professional who all they've done their lives was to be a dive instructor and they opened a place, hmm. right? But there's so much more to diving than that. I mean, honestly, I, I had a super interesting dinner about a month ago in Singapore with, um, with, with a friend and a, and, a, and a customer and they are focusing on retail. You know, th mm. this is their focus. This is how they run. There is a chain of 11, 11 shops in Japan, MIC 21. All they do is retail. Yeah. I mean, look at you guys and down under with um, Adreno. You know, it's a very, very different model. So mm. I think, you know, it's catching up. It's catching up. There's obviously this industry is comprised of two pillars or three pillars, right? You've got your training you've got your travel and you've got your equipment mm -hmm. and those are all in the same industry, but in their own, our own go to microcosmos, very different industries in their own, mm. on their own. Right. I think the retailers or the manufacturers, manufacturers and retailers are uh, mostly the ones that catch up the most to what's happening in the real world, mm. as we like to call it. <laughs> right. Because they have to, they have to, they are, you know, I, I, I just heard this from one of the manufacturers who told me in the last, three years since the pandemic and everything that happened I, I, we all know supply chain blah 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 but the cost of a chip to put in a dive computer which is the same chip that goes in the car industry same chip that goes in many other industries that factory doesn't discriminate between who they sell it to there's a price to it and that's who they sell it right mm. um has tripled yeah tripled in cost so you know they have to catch up yeah because otherwise they won't be able to compete and off they go. So I think they are the closest ones. Um, and then I think, you know, training, obviously there's, there's a lot of catching up with a lot of the digital, what's the word for it? digitalization, right? Like now everything is online and you've got your, your kind of, you can do your e-learning before you actually do something. And, and, and there's that side of the house, right? And then there's a travel side of the house where, where sometimes, I mean, again, coming from, from, my perspective sometimes you just go especially during the pandemic and after right like let's say you you booked you booked a trip and you couldn't go are you seriously going to call a Qantas and yell at them that you want your money back because of a force majeure mm. or Marriott or you would tell Marriott oh I want to book a room but I don't want to pay a deposit because it's who knows what's going to happen? Are you seriously going to do that? When you purchase your flight, you just purchase your flights, right? To um, Jordan. To those, to Jordan, right? Yeah. So you would not say the, to the airline, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pay 10% of my ticket value now and then the rest, maybe a week before I arrive because who knows what's going to happen. Mm. Yeah. You're not going to do that. But yet we're expected to behave by those laws and rules that people think. So I think in that sense, from a business perspective, we're a bit like years yeah. Back. yeah but that's the charm of it as well right that's <clears throat> that's the whole of it together it's the good with the bad yeah i think an element of that as well is not only the customer uh holding back on you know spending but the fact that there's been the in industry battle to get those customers so it's it's a very competitive market and you've always got some arsehole who's going to drop it down as cheap as possible to undercut everyone because they'll take five bucks instead of 50 bucks as profit. Um, but then the knock-on effect, the customer then sees because they're not getting the quality that they expected. Um, but in a roundabout exactly. way, I don't think it's all on the, the customer. Older I think it's grow. also on those those cowboys that are out there doing the, the, the shit within the industry. And that's the bit of the industry that we, as people within the industry, need to clean up, quite frankly. Oh, so is that is that if you were to change one thing about the dive industry, is that what you would change? Yeah. Take the cowboys all the, all out. The cowboys. Shoot them down. Yeah, all the cowboys, I'd fucking close them down now. Because it's the cowboys that will 
more than likely be the issues with uh, people getting injuries as well and lack of training. Oh, look at me getting on a little soapbox. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's it's but it's true. It's true, you know. And people don't see that. You know, what people see is they go on vacation for a week and that's it. And the, you know, and that's normal. Like if I mm. would go on mm. to buy a car, then I wouldn't necessarily see all the bits and pieces behind it, right? Because it's not an industry for me. This is just a one-off activity yeah. or once a year activity. If you ask my dad, who's total lost three cars in the past three years, but um, <laughs> and not, n none was his fault. Oh, okay. None of okay. those was his fault. Yeah, yeah. which is ridiculous. Um, but I think, you know, the those those things, and it goes back to the question you asked me about safety. Hmm. Uh, look, we had, a, we had a lady, this is, oh my God, five, four or five years ago, um, she, she asked us for a quote, you know, she was coming to do Maggetti. She asked us for a quote, look, we're not cheap, mm. nor do we want to be. We have an excellent product, which is excellent value for money. It's a safe dive operation. It's a great resort to stay in and the staff is exquisite. Mm. I am at a point in my life where I would pay a little more to have a great product. I would, oh, and that's yeah. how I shop, you know, that's how I shop like my, you know, I would buy um, organic honey where places where I know the bees were treated right I will invest more in getting you know something that aligns with my beliefs so for example all the biodegradable cleaning products etc 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 right you would mm -hmm. pay more for things that are important to you mm. so it should carry on to your travel experience of course we all like good deals mm. everybody likes a good deal right everybody likes to buy on sale but on the other hand when you think about you know this is your vacation the delta, like we said before, the difference between 90 and 100 is sometimes 100%. Yeah. So you want to really think about it. And I think the older you grow, you kind of go, mm, yeah, yeah, I want to have a comfortable bed. I want to, you know, little little things that matter, yeah. right, yeah. to us old people. Anyway, this lady contacted us. We gave her a quote. She said, yeah, 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 no, it's too expensive, whatever. She went with one of those cowboys, as you call them, one of those pirates with a freaking compressor on the beach and some falling apart boat and uh, going back to oxygen on the boat, had an incident underwater. Mm -hmm. um, the dive guide didn't even pay attention. I think that the, the, the dive guide actually was a dive master, but without any insurance, of course, yeah. uh, nor did the operation. Mm -hmm. And um, and then she surfaced and then she got on the boat and she was like, look, I think I got bent. And they were like, oh no, there's no way you got bent. And she's like, can I have some oxygen? They were like, no, we don't have oxygen on the boat. Okay. And then she said, look, I really think this was an upper island, right? So there's no hospital, <laughs> none of that stuff. Like you definitely need, you need to get back to Negros, which is 45 minutes away. But the guys were like, well, yeah, we're, we're really sorry, but there's one more dive to do. So you don't have to dive this dive. You just sit on the boat and wait. Oh, Jesus. Um, she sat on the boat. By the time she got to the hospital, this was about five hours later. Um, yeah. She had to go to Cebu to the chamber mm -hmm. uh, where she ended up with 10 treatments, which is quite a lot. Yes. So... Just saying, you know, have those things in mind when you go, oh, yeah, I'm going to go for a 20, you know, 20 bucks dive. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. But there is there is a lot of things in the operation uh, behind it. And, you know, I love my life. I've got my bucket list. I want to go see my bucket list. I don't want to lose <laughs> uh, lose out on anything uh, for for a couple hundred dollars. So exactly. That's just exactly. Me. Yeah. Well said. And on that note, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap this bad boy up, shall we? It's a bad girl, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or rather a good girl. Let's wrap yeah, this yeah. good girl up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, folks. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And uh, we'll put the links in the show notes and everything like that. that you can get hold of Ronnie and uh, wing your way to the Philippines. And I promise you I'm going to be 99% of the way there already of uh, sorting out a, a group kind of expedition in the next 12 18 24 months something like that so keep your eyes peeled on the website and we'll see what we'll do we'll work together and make something happen <laughs> amazing amazing thank you so much for having me thank you for so much for um listening guys and uh go go to the philippines go dive the philippines love it embrace it enjoy every moment and we'll finish on that one fantastic thanks very much for your time and i'll speak to you soon ciao everybody the podcast for the inquisitive diver